Good morning, and welcome to the Standing Senate Committee on Banking, Trade, and Commerce. Today is the 19th meeting in our special study on the uses of digital currency, including the potential risks, threats, and advantages of these electronic forms of exchange. To date, the committee has received presentations from a wide range of witnesses, including government agencies, digital finance experts, academics, and Bitcoin companies. Today, our meeting will be split into two one-hour panels. In our first hour, we will hear from MoneyGram International, and in the second hour, we will hear from Professor of Finance Samir Sadi from the University of Ottawa. Moving to our first witness, the focus will be on a money service business and how it relates to digital currency. Today, I'm pleased to welcome from MoneyGram International, Mr. Derek McMillan, Senior Director regional compliance. MoneyGram is the second largest global money transfer and payment services company in the world. It provides quick and reliable worldwide fund transfers over mobile and online channels through their vast network of over 350,000 agent locations in over 200 countries. We will begin with an opening statement from Mr. McMillan to be followed by questions from the senators. Mr. McMillan, thank you for appearing before us today. The floor is yours, sir. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to appear before the committee. Um, as you said, my name is Derek McMillan, and I am the Senior Regional Director for Compliance for MoneyGram International. I'm based in Toronto. Um, MoneyGram, headquartered in Dallas, Texas, is recognized throughout the world as a leading global payment services company. We have over 2,500 employees and over 347,000 agent locations worldwide. With 2.5 billion consumers around the world, about half the world's population not being able to rely on traditional banks for financial services, basic financial services, MoneyGram provides critical access to money transfer services to millions of these consumers who send funds to loved ones for life's essentials. MoneyGram is a service that helps people send money anywhere in the world quickly, reliably, and affordably. From New York to New Delhi, or Ottawa to Nairobi in more than 200 countries, MoneyGram's money transfer service moves money quickly and easily around the world through person-to-person, -person, directly to account, ATMs and kiosks for cash deposits and cash receives, cash to a mobile fun, phone, and cash to a card. MoneyGram is dedicated to investing in innovation and technology in order to offer our customers as many convenient and accessible options to send and receive money as possible. While retail locations will always play a critical role in serving our customers, we also believe that online and mobile money offers opportunities to make moving money more accessible for millions of people, especially those in rural areas that lack easy access to bank locations. In addition, consumers can now send money via MoneyGram directly into bank accounts into four of the world's largest remittance receive markets, China, Mexico, India, and the Philippines, and into the largest mobile wallet consumer bases in the, excuse me, in the world. MoneyGram is proud of the wide variety of services it offers Canadians through its 6,000 plus agent locations and its long-standing relationship with Canada Post and our retail agent network. We remain committed to working with our agents to provide the most competitive, secure, reliable, and accessible money transfer services to our customers in Canada. I understand that this committee has been reviewing issues surrounding cryptocurrencies. While MoneyGram is dedicated to supporting innovation, MoneyGram does not accept cryptocurrencies at this time. We have heard concerns regarding cryptocurrencies from various regulators which classify the activity as high risk. If or when cryptocurrencies become a regulated currency or commodity, MoneyGram would entertain working with cryptocurrencies the same way that we do with other payout methods today. We would also hope that cryptocurrencies would be regulated in a manner similar to money transfer businesses with regard to anti-money laundering and safety and soundness requirements. Thank you again for inviting me to appear before the committee and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. McMillan, for your opening statement. Let me just understand, uh, an individual goes into an agent of yours in Toronto, tenders Canadian dollars, they're going to send it to New Delhi, the recipient in New Delhi will receive Indian rupees? Yes. And 
where does the exchange actually take place? In Canada, or is it taking place in India? And I'm interested in how much time does it take from the when you go in and you place that money in uh, at the agency in Toronto? When is it receivable in uh, in India? Sure. I'll, I'll walk through that transaction with you then. So a person walks into an agent location in Canada and uh, provides an amount of money in Canadian dollars to send to their uh, relative in India. The agent in Canada collects the funds and the information that we would need from the sender and enters it into MoneyGram's systems. Um, uh, the system controls what uh, elements would be required to obtain from that sender. The more you send, the more information we would get. Um, that agent then completes the transaction and gives a reference number to the sender. That sender then needs to communicate that reference number to the receiver uh, in India. Uh, in between the send and the receive, MoneyGram sits in the middle. So MoneyGram has now received this information and who it's being sent to. A number of controls and checks are in place between the transaction. Um, from a compliance standpoint, we have a number of rules that we would be, we would be looking for on the transaction. Um, but assuming that uh, it doesn't hit any of those rules requiring us to collect potentially some additional information, it's available to be picked up in India. The receiver in India walks into a location knowing that they have money available for them in their name and with that reference number. They walk into the location in India, provide that agent and uh, employee with the reference number. That agent will look up the transaction in their system. Uh, they will identify it, ask the receiver to, to verify their information and enter that into our systems. Um, and with that, they would then pay in rupees the, the uh, amount to the receiver. How the funds actually move, the agent in Canada had a bank account and the agent in India had a bank account and MoneyGram settles with the banks of the agent uh, a net settlement at the end of, uh, I think it's every 24 hours. Um, so we settle with the agents. So if an agent sent five transactions and paid out one, the net of four transactions uh, that they collected, we would pull from their bank account. If the agent in India um, had the reverse, we would push money to the agent in India. And just so I understand, uh, if I were to take the $100 that I want to transfer to India, I pay a fee at the point that I'm giving the money to the agent in Toronto, there is a transaction fee, I assume, for the conversion. And does the recipient pay a fee when they... No, the fee's up? paid by the sender. Um, the fee, all fees are paid by the sender? Correct. Uh, and, and it includes the transaction fee and then a potential currency exchange fee as well, um, which is transparent to the consumer. It's with that fee that, that MoneyGram would would uh, compensate the agent who sent it and paid it, but only the sender pays the fee. And if I could just, the question I asked that you didn't answer, if I went in this morning at 10 o'clock, when is that available to the recipient in India? It, it, it will be within minutes. Again, minutes. W subject to the controls that it may hit, we, we often will slow down certain transactions because it, it hits some sort of Right. rule or typology or, or a sanctions list. Um, so, so it's not every transaction, but most transactions is, it is available within minutes. Thank you. I'm going to go to my list of senators with questions, starting with Senator Belmar to be followed by Senator Massicott. Merci, M. le Président. Uh, merci d'être avec nous, M. McMillan. Donc, uh, vous avez répondu en partie à ma question. Et donc, ce que je comprends uh, de vos services, c'est que si mon fils m'appelle, il est en Amérique du Sud, et qui a tout perdu, euh, mais qui a son téléphone cellulaire et qui me demande de lui transférer de l'argent, je ne peux pas me servir de vos services parce qu'il n'aura pas de compte bancaire dans la ville nécessairement où il va être. Ça prend, donc c'est un transfert d'argent euh, entre des comptes bancaires. Donc, c'est ce que j'ai comme compris. S'il était seulement avec son, son mobile, euh, il ne pourrait pas recevoir euh, du crédit. Well, I'll, I'll uh, thank you for the question. I'll, I'll clarify that, that account situation. That was the agent that, that offered our service, not, not the consumer. 
We do have options where our senders can send directly to a bank account, but our person-to-person -person typical money transfer, the receiver does not need a bank account. They walk into the agent location, um, provide information to that person at the agent location, um, and collect the funds. Uh, there is no bank account involved. It's MoneyGram settling with the agent's bank account. Il doit aller quand même au lieu euh, de votre unité de service. Euh, ce ne sont, ça ne peut pas être, par exemple, transféré euh, dans une carte de crédit euh, par téléphone euh, mobile. We, we, uh, we do have uh, some corridors, like uh, Canada to China, we mentioned, where you could send directly to a bank account. Um, I, I, we have situations in Kenya where you can send directly to a mobile phone. So there are certain situations where uh, walking into the location isn't required, but that's the bulk of our business. So depending on this, the cell phone provider and whether or not MoneyGram has a relationship with that provider and they have mobile wallets and we've set up a uh, an, an agreement to, to work with them, then maybe that is an option, but, but generally that, that is limited to, to uh, the situations where we have that relationship set up. Okay. Okay. Merci. Thank you. Senator Massicott to be followed by Senator Tkachuk. Thank you. Thank you. Just uh, if you don't mind, first of all, thank you for being with us. This is useful to our deliberations. Uh, our speaker asked you on the process, but I wouldn't mind getting to the cost. And I know you're going to say depends, depends. But let's say, and, and in some poor countries, hundred dollars is a lot of money. Let's say hundred million dollars, <coughs> and I want to send it to an African country or something. Give me an idea from a commission sense. How much does a transaction cost percentage-wise? How much does a currency cost beyond the actual currency in the open market? Give me a sense of cost. Sir. Sure, and 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 as you've said, it does depend on how much you send. Or give me a, a, a two instances. Hundred bucks, a thousand bucks. All right, on a, on a hundred bucks, uh, it, it certainly would be a higher percentage because there's a, mi a minimum amount that we would we would need to collect in order to pay our yeah. and send and that? receive agent. What is that number? A hundred dollars. Uh, again, it depends on the country you're sending it to as well. I don't I don't know <coughs> the entire fee schedule, but um, choose, generally choose a country you know well. You can give me the answer to. Uh, I I would say. Five to ten dollars would be what I would be familiar with, and that is the uh, transaction cost. How about the, the currency? Currency again <laughs> varies by by country. Um, a lot of countries would pay out in, in 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 the same currency that it was sent, not for Canada, so that's maybe not an issue. But um, it would probably be between zero percent to a couple of percent beyond the actual market conversion, obviously. Yeah. And now, how about if it was a thousand bucks? Uh, the percentage would go down, um, but again, I've, I've, uh, I know it could range. Uh, uh, again, uh, not specifics, but I, I've seen 9.99 up to. Um, All include 9.99 is a transaction cost. Yeah. Okay. Um, and and up from there, uh, again, I don't. 200 countries, uh, and it varies. Okay. Uh, but that would probably be the low end. Now tell me the uh, we talked about earlier about you said depending upon the requirements, uh, you, when you said that you're referring to, you're referring to requirements to know your customer, identify sums. What's the minimum? You have internal policies. You say if it's more than a thousand bucks, we need this kind of information or that. Give me an idea what you, what you do there. Sure, um, and and a lot of these requirements come from the Proceeds of Crime, Money Laundering, yeah. Terrorist Financing Act, and the implementing regulations. Uh, so w with that act money transfer companies are required to collect identification at a thousand dollars and date of birth and occupation um, there's also situations where if you you have a business relationship with a customer you have to collect additional information and assess the risk of that relationship with that customer um, then reporting requirements kick in where if you're if you're sending out of or receiving from outside of Canada at $10,000 or more, you would need to uh, file a, a regulatory report, an EFT report with FinTrack. Um, and situations where you would be suspicious of the activity, um, again, you'd, you'd need to monitor for that. And that comes from where? That's because it's deemed to be a wire transfer? Is that, is right. that what it comes from? Money, money transmission, yeah. yeah. It's 1000 1000 or more. Okay. And relative to the fact that many people, you say, in, in say, in Africa don't have 
you. It's a predominantly a physical pickup of the cash. Do you have a lot of locations in, in choose Tanzania or to choose uh, um, uh, Kenya? Do you have a lot of, is it difficult for people to pick it up? Is there a lot of locations? It, well, our goal is to make it as convenient for our customers as we can. So uh, we're always looking for partnerships with, with um, and, and in many countries it's banks and post offices with, with uh, a wide spread so that it isn't inconvenient for so the customers. It's not, customers a, it's not an issue up. for most people. Not a, not an issue, yeah. but again, there are stories I'm sure where people have to travel a couple hours to pick up their funds. But in general, we with the 350,000 spots where they could do it, it's uh, it's 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 convenient. Yeah, talk to me if I, I could. You got Apple coming out with a, you're putting a lot of pressure, coming up with this virtual currency in their manner. It's not decentralized; it's centralized. You got PayPal. Uh, how do you see that those? those say three years or five years now compared to yours what how do you see this evolving well and as far as the evolving uh, moneygram as well as looking at ways to innovate and and ways to change i think uh, besides that i think there for a long period of time there will always be a need for cash in 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 some countries i think um the movement of uh, a country in Eastern Europe or Africa to something other than cash, I think is a is a long way away. But I do think it is something that uh, will continue to evolve. What's your average transaction amount transfer wise? Uh, I th it's it's three hundred to four hundred uh, Canadian dollars on the send side. Okay. Roughly. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Senator Takachik, to be followed by Senator Tams. Thanks, uh, Mr. McMillan. Um, when you mentioned uh, uh, that you would not necessarily, or, or when you mentioned that you wouldn't be looking at using a, a, d a digital currency like, say, Bitcoin, unless there were regulation, what kind of regulation would you be looking for uh, for you to adopt maybe a system like that? Sure, and, and I get I guess an example would be our compliance program. We take a risk-based approach. So at this point, with with what we've seen and with regulators and what they've told us, it, it is definitely a high-risk um, scenario. And so what we would want is uh, adequate controls in place to mitigate a lot of that risk in order to feel comfortable um, partnering and offering um, s some additions to our services. Would it? Would it uh, require would it require uh, like regulations by by uh, or backings of of the currency by the country involved or just like I, I don't know how you maintain a stable yeah. currency when it trades um, you know the Canadian currency is going is going down compared to American currency and going up compared to the euro it gets awful complicated so. But I would think Bitcoin would be, or a one-world currency, would be a lot cheaper to transmit than worrying about all these different countries to, and all the different currencies. No, I would agree with that, and I, I guess where I, where we would, where I'm focused, and and what my role at MoneyGram would be, the anti-money laundering, terrorism financing aspects of things, and and the an anonymity of of a product is something that is attractive to 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 criminals as well. And I think if there was something that helped with that issue, that would go a long way. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Tannis. Thank you for your presence here today, Mr. McMillan. A uh, couple of things. You mentioned Kenya. Uh, so, and, and we heard yesterday about Impeza. Uh, is that, you, you mentioned that in Kenya you actually hook into a phone network. Is that what you were talking to or talking about? Yes. Okay. And so they're in the transmittal business, obviously, and in the storage business, right? Um, are you looking at getting into the storage business at all in any, or are you active in any, uh, in any uh, countries in the, you know, kind of Impeza in another place? I, I'm myself not familiar with it from okay. um, the U.S. and Canada standpoint, uh, as far as a wallet or, or right. like holding funds. Uh, it, it is something that I know um, different money service businesses are are looking at for sure. Okay. Um, I, I'm I'm uh, I'm curious to know. I mean, your 
your organization is kind of uniquely positioned along with and, and you know mentioned number two I think uh, the chair did that you're number two in this space Western Union I assume is number one is that right that is correct okay um, but I mean your whole story the way you do things and so on is virtually identical is it not uh, the, the very similar so, companies so you guys both Western Union and yourselves be uniquely positioned to give us a view on regulation around money service businesses tell us where in the 200 countries or is that where you said however many countries you operate in I guess there aren't 200 countries maybe there are um, where Canada stacks up in terms of the level of rigor of regulation and so on you know are we uh, what are your colleagues uh, tell you from MoneyGram and you know the the uh, compliance guy in Kenya or the compliance guy in Germany, what does he have to say uh, when you compare notes? Sure, from, from, an, from an AML standpoint, I, I know the FATF um, provides recommendations for countries and I know Canada is a, is a member and, and, and continues to update its regulations. Um, I, I would say Canada has a strong regulatory regime based on uh, the, the 200 countries that are out there. I, you know, I've a specific on that. I think a lot of countries don't have the equivalent of the EFT report that tracks the movement of money across the border, and I think that that's a, an element in Canada that that is useful that we don't see in a lot of places. Um, where where don't you see it? That uh, you're surprised. Uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, for, for quite some time didn't have a. They have the CTR, which is cash coming in uh, mm -hmm. or going out, and but they don't have the equivalent or hadn't had the equivalent of that cross-border money transfer reporting. They have it now. Uh, there's a lot of talk about it. I, I, um, I guess maybe, uh, in, in, if you're not comfortable, I, I understand. But you know, we're looking at at where where does the regulation need to be need to sit for this, and we're being told it's the on ramps and the off ramps, which is the cash in and the cash out uh, points, and that's squarely in in your business. Um, but that'll only work in a in a virtual environment if everybody's on board for that. So if if uh, if all we do is move the cash in and cash out to another jurisdiction, um, that's a concern. Do you could you tell us other countries that would be likely candidates that would you know that are not way out there countries? I mean, G20 countries where you think there's a risk that uh, cash in cash out without being tracked could set up shop um, it, I don't uh, in in the G20 I, I wouldn't suggest that any of those countries would be a weak spot where criminals would set up shop I, I think that so the top 20 countries more or less are all kind of running things the same way I think generally I, I would say all of them uh, are are engaged and reviewed by the FATF, uh, who who attempts to make sure that all countries come up to certain standards. And okay. I would say that they were all they're all engaged in that process. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Mr. McMillan. Perhaps you could just expand for the committee. You represent MoneyGram. You indicated that MoneyGram's head office is in Dallas. But we also understand you have 350,000 agent locations. You operate in 200 countries. What is MoneyGram? In other words, uh, do you own some of the agencies? Do you own your trading desk? Uh, what is MoneyGram? Sure. Uh, as, as an MSB, MoneyGram has built a network of relationships in every country, practically, in the, in the world. And we work with those agent locations to offer um, mainly money transfer services, person to person. Um, there are there are stores that we own ourselves, but um, but part part of me. Other than the United States, there are agent locations in other countries where MoneyGram actually owns it. I but see. generally, the relationships we have are with other agents. Like if we look at Canada, for instance, our, we have a long-standing relationship with Canada Post. So if you go to a Shoppers Drug Mart 
um, and and want to send money, you go to the Canada Post desk, and MoneyGram is what uh, is what you will send. And it's the connection of of those 200 countries to that Shoppers Drug Mart that I, that is offered to our consumers. Very helpful. And the second thing I'd like to ask is, uh, you report to FinTrack. Yes, we do. As a money services business, could you share with the committee what experience uh, you're prepared to make public that uh, has involved terrorist financing or money laundering? Uh, I'm not asking for a specific indication, but uh, how prevalent is this in your business? Um, the prevalence, well, we, we definitely report to FinTrack. Um, I, we know some of our reports, as with other MSBs, have led to disclosures that FinTrack makes to law enforcement that resulted in um, information that got uh, people arrested. I don't think I can comment on any specifics, but um, but we do provide what what we can to be that piece of a puzzle that FinTrack will put together to to disclose it to law enforcement. And, and you file uh, SARS with uh, FinTrack as other institutions would. Yep, we file uh, STRs with with FinTrack um, definitely. Are there any further questions from Senator Senator Massicott, please? Yeah, your business is only transfer cash. You don't do conversion or translation of currencies. We're not a currency exchange business, but when you when when the agent in Canada is accepting money, it's Canadian dollars, and when we're paying out anywhere outside of Canada, it's not. Um, so there is an element of a currency okay. exchange, but it's a money transfer. You just can't go in and say I want American dollars and come out with American dollars. You don't no, that's not that MoneyGram's okay. business. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And in Canada, you indicated your association with Canada Post. Would you have other agencies other than Canada Post in Canada? Yes, we do. We have other other retail agent locations um, uh, in in different cities within Canada as well. And you operate? Would you have storefront locations uh, where it's solely MoneyGram is the operation? No, is they're it usually included in other uh, entities. It, it's other entities. It's it's people with a with a storefront. Um, like a Canada Post location um, that offer our service as well as their core business. Mr. McMillan, I thank you very much for your appearance today. You've been very helpful in our deliberations. Great, my pleasure. We will suspend for a few minutes. Sadi holds a PhD in finance from Queen's University and has taught at Queen's, the Royal Military College, and the University of Ontario Institute of Technology. His work has been published in leading peer-reviewed journals and he acts as a consultant for several companies and government agencies. It's a pleasure to have you before our committee today, Mr. Sa Professor Sadi, and perhaps you have an opening statement that you would like to make and then we will ask some questions. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair and Honourable Member of the Committee. Uh, thank you for inviting me here today to speak with you about uh, virtual currencies. My name is Samir Sadi, as you mentioned, and I'm an assistant professor of finance at the University of Ottawa, where I teach corporate finance at MBA, executive MBA programs. I also conduct empirical research. Oh, just a little slower because the translators oh, okay. are having a little trouble no keeping problem. up with you. No problem. Thank you. So I'm also uh, conducting re empirical research on merger acquisitions, corporate governance, and market efficiency, initial public offerings, and volatility modeling. And oh, slower. Slower. Okay. slower. They can't. I they get can't this from up. my student all the time. So. <laughs> I know you're enthusiastic about it. <laughs> okay. So um, as I mentioned, I conduct empirical research on merger acquisitions, uh, IPOs, corporate governance, and volatility modeling, and the market efficiency. So my recent research are related on how social media affect investors' behaviors as well as corporate investment and uh, financing decisions. Uh, I've been recently involved in a joint project where we try to uh, modelize like, uh, the volatility of bitcoins and pr uh, check their predictabilities. So there are about 20 cryptocurrencies that are crowding the virtual currency scene right now, and there are rapidly evolved Evolving as a topic of interest for many stakeholders. 
the most prominent is Bitcoin and has been on the market since 2009 and is created through mining process with every transaction saved in the blockchain. Actually, you know, if you think about it, virtual currency are, and uh, online payment are not new. Eh? They've been around for decades now. Um, what makes Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies uh, special is that uh, they are purely like 100% decentralized peer-to-peer -peer network that allow for proof and transfer of ownership of virtual currency without the need for intermediary. Bitcoin is a disruptive technology which raises both hopes and fears in the mind of consumers, businesses, investors, charities, and regulators. In fact, there are several advantages that virtual currency could offer to different stakeholders and to the wide e economy as a method of payment. Moreover, the disrupted ledger technology that supports these virtual currencies has significant potentials for innovative applications of the te this technology across financial service and beyond. At the same time, however, virtual currencies present some existing, existing and potential risks that could harm consumers, financial system, and even the national security, which is now a very important matter, especially for Canada, our country, who is currently facing the threat of terrorism like never before. So it's not surprising that several countries, including Canada, are trying to introduce some regulations aiming at creating a hostile environment for illicit users of digital currencies while at the same time, of course, providing a supporting environment for their use, for their legitimate use to flourish. As Tom Carper, like the, he's the Homeland Security Committee chairman in the US, puts it, rather than play walk and mole with the latest website, currencies and other methods criminals are using, we need to develop thoughtful, nimble and sensible policies that protect the public without stiffing innovation and economic growth. Despite its significant potentials, virtual currency has so far been adopted by only a relatively small number of consumers and businesses worldwide. This is due to several factors, including the lack of regulation or regulatory framework that is needed to enhance the credibility and legitimacy of digital currencies. This lack of re uh, regulatory framework continues actually to cause some uncertainty for businesses. Another factor is the accessible, excessive sorry, volatility of their, of their value, yes, particularly Bitcoin. Investors who believe in Bitcoin when it first emerged made millions of dollars in the beginning. But later investors who, investor who invested later on lost millions of dollars because the value of Bitcoin crashed. Bitcoin volatility proved to be double-edged sword for investors, right? So uh, the same volatility in dollars to Bitcoin exchange rate was frequently affected by negative media coverage on arrests related to illicit financial activities, financial activities and by the security problem that led to different breaches. There's lots of examples I'm sure you know. Of. Businesses that are investing in Bitcoin are also finding it difficult, finding difficulties opening bank accounts as, as some banks still considering or in our, uh, some countries that treating virtual currencies or digital currencies are as fraudulent. Besides the negative media coverage, there are other factors that can explain the high volatility of Bitcoin. For instance, this technology they used in the, in this, uh, the platform and this industry and the community of uh, Bitcoins or digital currency are still at the beginning of stage, right? Large traders of Bitcoins can have significant impact on the exchange rate. In addition, many investors, especially people, they do not know what what is bitcoins or what is digital currency and how they fully, how they, uh, they work. This gives rise to lots of noise trading. This is the way we see this in even normal exchange, in exchange, stock exchange. Noise traders usually in induce a lot of volatilities. So lo we see lots of trading not related to fundamentals, it's just based on noise. On the good side, however, virtual currencies have, fitness, have witnesses and em the emergence of private funds and alternative virtual currency investment. Amongst many things, the creation of hedge funds that encompass strategic trading on virtual currency volatility has come, become a trend now. So there's a creation of new funds to make money based on the volatility of this uh, digital currency. 
On February 25, 2015, the New York Stock Exchange announced the investment in the US-based coin, uh, Bitcoin exchange and wallet service Coinbase. So now Coin Coinbase exchange, Coinbase, sorry, exchange is now the first regulated Bitcoin exchange which provides what it seems a reliable and secure platform for Bitcoin trading. And this is also big, big uh, backed, sorry, by New York Stock Exchange. Last Tuesday, Noble Markets, a platform from trading Bitcoins, announced that it's adopting the same softwares used by major security exchange, and this is provided by NASDAQ Group. So many analysts see this em embracement of, by Bitcoin, uh, of Bitcoin sorry, by New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ, which are the, more, the biggest U.S. exchange uh, operator, as a sign that digital, currencies is, digital currency is coming up from underground, is here to stay. So thank you, Mr. Chair and um, honorable member of the committee, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Professor. If I may start on the premise that one of the requirements of a currency is to maintain a store of value. You've talked about the tremendous volatility of the price of Bitcoin. What are you suggesting it's through regulation that that volatility is going to be removed? Would you accept, firstly, that for a currency to be successful, it has to maintain some value? Yes, I agree. I agree that um, it's, 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 it's very important that to keep the value, otherwise, you know, there will be including a lot of volatile people losing money, people, uh, investors try to uh, leave the, this industry. But if you regulate it, the problem, for example, for, for with Bitcoin is that the lack of regulation, that's one major problem. And the Bitcoin community, from what I read, is that they're looking for regulations to legitimize their business. So if you uh, regulate it, you give more legitimacy a credential, you know. That leads to more confidence from the consumers, from investors, from business, from businesses. And that's what probably reduced the volatility on the long run, because regulation is only one factor. But when you introduce uh, sorry, uh, regulations, o on the long run, there will be more, more and more users of bitcoins. So the volume will go up. And this will stabilize the volatility on the long run. Uh, you know, talking about volatility, and I don't know if you answered, maybe you will ask me these questions. I'm honestly surprised why people are surprised that Bitcoin are volatile. This is only created in 2009. If you think about IPOs, initial public offerings, when private companies go public, although we know, sometimes we know about lots of information about these private firms, but still, the market re is very volatile, you know, when for first day, first week, even th up to six months. So it should not be, we should not be surprised about Bitcoin being volatile. And if you think about it, in the beginning, it was up to 2014 to 13 was really volatile. And then if you look at the graphs, uh, it's, it's becoming more stable. Okay, the volatility went down substantially. So, so uh, yeah, coming back to your question, regulation is actually what they're looking for. But not too much regulation, because if you put too much regulations, that's lead to increasing of, or in terms of comply, cost of compliances. And this lead to higher cost for them. And this is growing industry. Eh? This is growing industry. So if you put too much regulations, that will actually hamper the growth. And actually, maybe, you know, they're looking for places, a country where they can grow, so they can easily move to other country where the regulation is more friendly. So. Thank you, Professor. No problem. Our first question will come from Senator Tkachuk to be followed by Senator Massicott. Uh, uh, th thank you very much. Uh, uh, on the question of regulation, uh, specifically, what, would you, what advice would you provide to us and to the Canadian government for the, to provide incentive for the growth and widespread use of Bitcoin uh, and also to establish some faith in the marketplace for the use of Bitcoin. So it's not only the Bitcoin producers that would be happy, but the consumers themselves would be more comfortable using, using it. So, okay, in terms of regulation, they, they want to be recognized and at the same time <coughs> recognize, okay, you protect, same time, same, you, you allow for growth and uh, uh, encourage the growth and this uh, innovative use of this kind of technology or currencies because it has two things here. There's a currency itself and the technology used is very innovative. 
At the same time, you protect consumers. Uh, the problem here is, uh, I think there is a lot of opportunity here. For example, you can protect consumers because there is a lot of risk there, and many people are scared. They think it's a scam. Many people look at the because I'm using say, social media to study other f effects, and one of the things we looked at we looked at how people dis con talk on the web, uh, social media, sorry, about bitcoins, and many actually think it's a scam. Like it's, it's not really it's, it's a Ponzi scam. Scheme, sorry, and then. You can, in terms of protecting the consumers, it's better not to in introduce the regulations. Because if you introduce regulation, because honestly, if you think about it, the risks are not huge. The risks are not huge. The, the community itself are trying to protect the consumer by coming up with new technologies and systems to protect the consumers from frauds. Okay? So it's, the system is actually trying to uh, protect itself. But what you can provide is, instead of regulation when it comes to uh, protecting consumers, is to come up with the best practice standards. So best practice standards that, people, uh, that, that can be followed without imposing regulations on the uh, on, on, uh, Bitcoin community. That's how I, how I see it. Uh, Give me an example. Uh, an example would be... Um, <coughs> An example would be, for example, is to um, allow allow the consumers, for example, to to get uh, his money back refunded. I know so far it's difficult for some um, for con transaction to be tracked, and also to get your money back. But but Bitcoin community, re looking at some of them, or creating this kind of uh, online uh, uh, ways of uh, buying goods, is that you can. You can. It's possible to to know who's the your your consumer to know who's the buyers as well. If you if you, you can investigate get this information, the problem now there is no, there is no. It's not possible for the government to intervene and and reverse the transactions. But maybe you can. The government can introduce a legislation when they can reverse the transaction and know who's the 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 identity of both. Because one thing people attracted to this uh, currency is the anonymity, right? But it's possible. There's still a debate, to be honest, whether it's possible or not. But according to the expert on uh, the, uh, coming up with this technology, they say it's possible to identify the two, two and the two, um, the customer and the suppliers. And the suggesting is that the government will be allowed or have the capability to reverse the transactions and identify who's in these uh, two parties. And this way you can protect the consumers and also protect the buyer as well. So if I, so what you're saying is, so if I was buying something online, so, yes. uh, uh, so I, I buy um, clothing, for example, or something like that, or sportswear or skis. So if I buy it online and I pay, and they accept Bitcoin, I pay with Bitcoin, but I never receive it. It's a false website. They don't really have skis. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I lose I lose the Bitcoin. So what you're saying, but how would you how would you protect how would you protect that, or would you or would you regulate to the point where people would have to get permission, would would have to be judged in some way, whether Biz Better Business Bureau or Chamber of Commerce, as being a legitimate supplier of the product that they're advertising. In other words, some stamp of approval is that what you're looking yes, at? Yes, you the bitcoins, the bitcoin, I mean the <coughs> currency, digital currency platform. They can, for example, coming up with, uh, uh, for example, eBay. When you go try to buy from eBay, they can whether it's a good to deal with that person or that entity or not. You yeah. can do the same thing with, I think, with, uh, with digital currencies. The problem here, if the buyers or the uh, the buyer, for example, in Canada. And the company, or supposed to be a company or a person, is somewhere else in Afghanistan. How can you regulate that? So one of the things is to do actually save a lot of time, sorry, and also money, is that to have international regulations. Like all countries that dealing with Bitcoin, I know it looks like a very big project, but instead of every country has its own jurisdictions, why not to have an international jurisdiction? Very like. Com, like com, uh, in terms of harmony, in terms of we dealing with the same issues, because the same type of technology, why not coming up with the same type coherent uh, kind of uh, jurisdictions that can help protect everybody else? So that's what one thing to do. Because you can protect consumer in Canada, but probably you cannot cons protect but consumer you, if dealing. You probably with can protect. Can you protect them when using regular currency? I mean, that's right. That's right. Uh, so exactly. It, it probably, you know. But at the same time, if the person 
can accept visa and uses visa and transacts visa, maybe you know somebody has recognized them somewhere. So that's right. Uh, that may, that may be a way. Uh, so in, in Canada, just w one more question, Chair. In Canada, what can I buy with Bitcoin? Honestly, I never bought anything with Bitcoin. To I be neither have I. So I'm just outside uh, yes, of our chairman buying Bitcoin. <laughs> yes, I never. But uh, <laughs> I don't know what can I buy with Bitcoin. Can, honestly, the way of thinking as I was thinking about is buying Bitcoin to make money. To be honest, trading yeah. on Bitcoin because the way of thinking about it, I didn't ever bought anything with Bitcoin. But uh, just looking yesterday at the tradings, uh, like it's really one. I'm not suggesting that you buy now, but it's actually not a bad idea to buy now. Buy bitcoins now. <laughs> I'm not giving you advice. I'm just talking about my own. I'm just talking to my wife yesterday to buy now because if you look at the long run, it looks like it's going to be going out to the roof in terms of so, value. So is it a is it a currency or is or is or is it a commodity? That is both. It's both. Oh, it's both. And how it I can be it. both. It can be both. Yeah. Like gold. Yeah, it can be both. Actually, it's even better than gold. I think it's better than gold. <laughs> yes, if you look at the volatility even now. <laughs> yeah. You're feeling better, you go buy some more. Yes. Gold Double now, down. <laughs> even, uh, think about store, storing, the, you know, storing gold, you know, it's, it's dangerous if you store it at home. <laughs> you know, uh, the cost and everything, the security and everything. Yeah. Currency it can be stored, you know, online and stuff like that to be secure. <laughs> but talking honestly about gold, like now the volatility is, it's of, the, of the Bitcoin is less or close to the volatility of gold. Of gold. Right now. Yeah. So it's interesting how it is converging. But it could be going up again. What is, sorry, I keep talking about volatility because that's what I'm working on now, is uh, it's not clear whether people are, are, are trading based on informations or based on just speculation. And that's, that's the problem for investors or for consumers, you know, in terms of value, eh? because it affects the value directly. It's not clear. But uh, uh, what I'm getting at is, though, if you can't buy anything with it, like what value does it have? Like, uh, that, that's I don't know. Point. I'm sure you can buy a lot of things with it, right? Because I honestly, I, I said I never bought anything with it, but yeah. I'm sure you can buy a lot of things with it. You can also uh, buy, uh, I know, of, and remember reading an article about Afghanistan, this lady who was uh, buying, uh, uh, using the bitcoins, the buy, allow you to buy um, computers and stuff like that. Not, ah. not can get c currency in exchange but you get uh, other goods, Software. Other goods. exactly, yeah. online. Okay, th thanks, Chair. Thank you. Senator Massicott, to be followed by Senator Belmar. Yeah, I was anxious to get, to get on the mic, Chair, because I want to warn you, the only people listening to this program is our mother-in-laws and our older parents, and I don't want them to buy bitcoins. Mother, don't buy bitcoins. I want to correct that. The, uh, but having said that, uh, go back your suggestions that there would be legislation you can reverse the transaction. But that was only, could only work if, the, if the, the service provider has all that information to start off with because it's all anonymous. Yeah. So that means you, to, get, to allow that to be effective, they would have to accumulate information on every major user constantly. And if you're going to do that, you just resolve the major issue where you now know who the players are. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm trying to catch so on. You, uh, but sorry, the buyer or sellers or the, 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 the intermediary, I mean the, the blockchain. Yeah. So I think they do have information. I think they do have information who's in, who's in, in tr um, involved in this tr transaction. This is what I understand. They do have information about that. But if they can also enforce it. If you introduce a legislation, they ask them, okay, you only allow, allow those who have IDs. Pro they provide you with all the ID information, address. I know it's possible to go around it and come up with different IDs. This is possible. So and your, your understanding is that they currently get all that information on every transaction. Exactly. So if it's needed, it's not, it should not be public, of course, yeah. but if it's needed, one can and uh, yeah, they can use it. That's contrary to my understanding. Uh, are you saying they should get that information for every transaction, no matter what the amount is? Uh, or if I go out and I buy a Bitcoin, I go buy a pack of gum. Do I have to give information? Where do you stop? It's, it's, Where a, do you it's, start? A, it's, a, it's a good point because in terms of cost and uh, tr but but say, for example, today you buy uh, 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 a gum and then, uh, you know, uh, one month later or one year later buy a bigger thing. So uh, probably you don't need to, I don't know, uh, to be honest, I, I got your point. In terms of buying small things, it's not a big thing. But maybe it's a good thing but the moment that you try to buy, you try buying small things, but the moment you buy a big thing, then they will ask you for your 
they build a file about you. So that's a good point, actually, in terms of uh, why yeah, and what's, what's the trigger. A big, what's a big thing to you? What, what dollar amount? Uh, you know, to be honest, it depends on the country. For if you go to Afghanistan Canada. or small, Canada. it's ca ca Canada. Canada um, if you think about average consumers, um, it's, it's difficult to predict because if you look at the si if in terms of salaries and wealth, like what was in Canada, what the average salary is forty-three thousand dollars or forty-seven. I don't know, probably it could be like just giving a, a ten percent of his wealth or something like that, or five percent of his monthly salary or something like that. But honestly, this is, has to be studied. You know, this yeah. has to be studied. How do you respond to the fact? You, obviously, the whole objective of that exercise is to make sure there's no fraud. And, and there's no exaggeration. But some of these guys sort of say, they, they say you're getting mixed up. You're getting mixed up between the, the, the mechanical side, the, the, the blockchain side, which is a phenomenal, uh, phenomenal for, form of technology, and, and the users. They say, look at HSBC. They just got to find over a billion dollars. They do all that information, highly reputable, supposedly so. So maybe just bad people. Maybe you shouldn't cost them that so much and getting all those I additional controls and information in. Because even our banking system is proven to have those same fraudulent practices. Mm -hmm. How do you respond to that? So, so can, you, can you refer, we refer to your question, sorry. In other words, you're, you're basically suggesting we put all these controls in place to yeah. make sure nobody gets frauded out of their money and so on. And yet within our banking system, yeah. with immense controls, immense know the client type regulations, AHBC is a good example, yes. where they've constantly abuse that system internationally, even in spite of international agreements? It, to be honest, there, there have been fraud for a long time, and there will continue to be fraud activity for a long time ahead of us. So we're trying with legislation or regulation is to protect the consumers, protect us, you know. Now, if you think about even not only fraud, like terrorism now, you know. So we're trying to protect the whole country, yeah? and. Uh, you have to, you only, you cannot make it zero, eh? impossible. Like when you're trading on the stock market, no matter what you do, you cannot make it zero. What you can do is like minimize it. That's what you have to do. That's, I think that's your, our job, your job, your job, sorry, it's not our job, is to minimize the risk of fraud. Yeah, I think everybody knows this cannot be zero because they always, some, even, you know, talking about components, uh, I also work on corporate governance. CEO, for example, they always find ways to, to make frauds, you know, uh, through compensation, they, no matter what, you know, and sometimes, sometimes, all CEOs? Uh, no, not all, of, not all of them. Yeah, I'm not. Yeah, uh, some uh, of them, are, most part? of them, yeah, most of them actually hardworking and honest people. But some, for example, backdating, stock option backdating. I'm sure you all heard of them. They, whenever, no matter what you come up with the legislation, they always come up with different things. And this funny thing is, actually, backdating was actually uh, proposed by a lawyer. He's supposed to, you know, a lawyer, he's supposed to, you know, do the opposite thing. So uh, what I'm saying, say it's good, uh, uh, it's always be a fraud, no matter any technology with Bitcoin or even new technology, I don't necessarily Bitcoin going to live forever, it's some new technology will come up. What I'm saying, there always will be a waste for, um, for fraud. There's always be window. These people probably working so hard. We don't tax evasion. We all face this. For example, in Greece, you notice it. In Canada as well, we have this problem. They always find ways to uh, fraud the system, to, to in engage in fraud. So you cannot make it zero, that's what I'm saying. At least minimize it. This is Interesting. I won't, I won't call up any further. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Senator Belmar to be followed by Senator Green. Merci beaucoup pour votre participation ici. Uh, Vous avez parlé beaucoup là, de la volatilité euh, du Bitcoin. Et puis, il y a un petit argument qui est un peu, euh, pas circulaire, mais ce que vous semblez dire, puis vous pouvez me corriger si ce n'est pas ce que vous avez dit, vous semblez dire que plus on va utiliser le Bitcoin, plus la volatilité va être basse. Mais en même temps, vous dites, pour réduire la volatilité, ça prend de la réglementation. Donc, euh, En d'autres mots, plus on en, en tout cas, il y a un petit côté là, on, on a besoin d'une régulation pour encourager les gens à utiliser le Bitcoin et finalement il va y avoir une auto une auto volatil un auto système qui va permettre euh, à, au Bitcoin de pas trop euh, varier dans le temps. Nous avons entendu beaucoup de personnes nous demander une réglementation et euh, certaines ont insisté sur le fait de ne pas en avoir trop, comme vous l'avez dit, mais d'en avoir euh, suffisamment et un focus 
a été fait sur l'idée de réglementer ce qui échange les, la monnaie, la crypto-monnaie en, en fiat monnaie, en, en, en monnaie euh, courante, en monnaie nationale. Alors, qu'est-ce que vous pensez de cette idée de réglementer ce qui échange la, les bitcoins en monnaie canadienne, par exemple, et de laisser faire euh, euh, à les échanges qui se font en bitcoin? ne pas réglementer, au fond, tout comme les échanges qui se font en monnaie canadienne. On ne réglemente pas tout ça quand, les, quand ça se fait en, en montant comptant. Alors, qu'est-ce que vous pensez de cette idée? Those who exchange uh, Bitcoin with currency, basically, they, they are operating like banks. And uh, in any place in the world, banks has to be regulated. Actually, it's one of the most heavily regulated sectors is, 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 bank, is banks. And think about it as virtual banks. And probably you don't want someone like running a bank in his garage with no supervision. Eh? So, so I think regulating those who exchange money with bitcoins is, is important, I think. Est-ce que ce serait suffisant? You know, I, I like the idea of uh, introducing regulation only what is needed. It's good to prevent, like vaccines, to prevent disease and stuff like that. But only when, especially when dealing with the market, not trying to discourage the industry is growing. Only when the, the threat is there or because so, it has to come like one consumer or some people like complain about and then you can react very quickly before it gets uh, larger. So that's, that's my, my philosophy. Only introduce when it's needed. Avec le principe de nécessité. Exactement. Euh, J'ai encore une question euh, par rapport, euh, bon, vous, vous avez dit que le bitcoin et les monnaies, les crypto-monnaies sont là pour demeurer. Oui. Hein? Ils sont là pour rester. Euh, comment pensez-vous que ce système va solutionner la problématique euh, de l'augmentation inhérente des coûts de transaction? Parce que là, actuellement, euh, quand il y a des transactions, la vérification se fait par des, par des mineurs ouais. qui sont payés en, en, en bitcoin. Puis on sait que l'offre des bitcoins est à 21 millions. Et à un moment donné, bon, il va falloir introduire des frais de transaction. Ne croyez-vous pas que ces frais de transaction vont freiner automatiquement euh, l'utilisation de cette monnaie ou vous voyez qu'on va solutionner... Euh, cette problématique-là d'une autre manière. Et mm -hmm. si oui, de quelle manière? Okay, it's true that when you, um, on the long run, now they're getting uh, some uh, a Bitcoin in exchange, but you can, for example, offer some commission if you want. Now you have the options to offer some commission if you want. But in the long run, it's true when the Bitcoins are, they need to be paid by quick commissions, and this will increase uh, fees, this will increase uh, the costs, I agree. But, you know, also, if you think about it, uh, um, if you compare it with other systems, still, even if you introduce some costs, uh, still it's much cheaper than, for example, Western Union, which is 9%, okay. and other credit cards was making $250 billion a year, you know. So, and also with the development, I think, I'm not a high-tech person, but, uh, or IT person, is that I think the developing of computing powers the cost will go down. So maybe it will be go up now, but ah, okay. it's high. But on the long run, I think, it's the cost will go, go down. This is, uh, this is my, okay. what I'm saying. Est-ce que je peux me permettre une autre question? Mm -hmm. Mon autre question est très théorique, mais comme vous êtes professeur d'université, ben je peux me permettre peut-être euh, de vous la poser. Euh, avec toutes ces crypto-monnaies qui, qui vont peut-être florir, là, vous avez... Euh, vous avez dit qu'il y en avait une vingtaine de, de sortes de crypto-monnaies. Est-ce que vous pensez que la politique monétaire d'un pays va être affectée par les crypto-monnaies? Notre capacité, en d'autres mots, à influencer là, le coût du crédit, euh, l'offre de monnaie. Right. This is now the nightmare of government and central banks. Uh, nightmare now is not really a threat because the volume is so low compared to the, the, the holy for the whole economy. But in the long run, it's true, they can, they can. But, uh, you know, I would like to see it, uh, see it this way. It's not, it doesn't have to be black or white. You know, they will either perish, these currencies, or they will dominate and uh, it can be something parallel. You know, if you want, 
use like fiat money, you can if you think other advantage with, uh, for example, small businesses doing export and stuff like that. So you'll have a lot of advantage with this kind of money with low transactions. And also, uh, it has a lot of advantage even in terms of reducing the cost for consumers, you know, uh, because when there is competition, then mm -hmm. we'll see the, the cost will go down. So either this money, uh, I will see it either this, I think this money will go can be another parallel system of uh, <coughs> not necessarily will replace. Uh, but, you know, if you think about 100 years, 100 years ago or 50 years ago and trying to, if I go back and trying to explain to some individual, have a time machine, always trying to explain time value of money with time machine, going back 50 years ago and talking to people about today's world, they would think I'm crazy, you know, what are you talking about? What is internet? What is, what does it do? So, uh, it's difficult to predict the future. Uh, there's a world economy like a uh, forum. And one of the futurists, supposed to be one of famous uh, economists, and he said, what are we doing here? Can we predict the future? We can. So we have to deal with the problem as they, as they come up, you know, as, uh, by necessity, convoluted. Uh, autre chose, and uh, I'm speaking French and English now. Uh, other things, um, uh, anyway, I lost my thoughts or idea, but, uh, um, yeah, this is how I see it. Could be a parallel system that would not harm the economy. But you know, notice that Bitcoin and this uh, digital currency came on the w after 2008 crisis. You know, this is phenomenal how people are trying to accept this and try to, they don't, they've lost, some of people lost faith in the system we are feeling. And this system we have a lot of, you know, lots of problems trying to fix. Eh? So uh, with, it's a very confusing world. We have the threat of terrorism, the technology, is so innovative now. Uh, honestly, com comparing myself with my students, younger students, uh, they are MBA at least f uh, full time. They're usually younger, and uh, I cannot keep up with the technology. I'm barely keep keeping up, trying to you know adjust myself to to. This. So I think 50 years from now it will be a totally different world, and we have people, smart people, also will try to deal with this problem. So I don't think, honestly, as a, th a threat. We should not, I think, hamper innovation because of our fear. This is how, this is how I see it. We just let it go, you know, it will, it will flow. The market has a system to correct itself. Yeah. Merci beaucoup. Sophie, please. Thank you. Senator Green to be followed by Senator Ringette. I've just got a small uh, question. Actually, it's a request. Um, I, I was very interested to hear what you said about uh, a volatility and the fact that uh, Bitcoin is not as a, a volatile when you com compare it to other uh, new things as the reputation of, of Bitcoin. The, 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 the reputation of, of Bitcoin is that it is volatile. It's not a good place for, for money, et cetera. And that's, so that was something new, I think, for me that, uh, you, uh, that, that you said. And my request is that, that I think that our report ought to have a, a, a discussion about uh, volatility. So I'm just w I'm wondering if you have any more information or charts that you could uh, send to the clerk which would ex ex express that uh, view. Okay. I'm working on it now. Um, it's, it's really actually we are in the, uh, we collected the data, we did some preliminary uh, uh, results. I can send you when we have the full uh, study. I can send you with some explanation, or you can send you the full study with all the details. So I would be glad to, to share this with you, definitely. Thank and, you, uh, uh, you know, to be honest, lots of, um, because I have other study of media coverage, how media can affect uh, uh, CEO behavior and decisions. And a lot of bad reputation comes from the media. If you look at the fraud, it's not really huge compared to the, the whole system, you know. So, but the media is good as, you know, they, they sell, only bad news sells, right? So that's, if you look on the internet, on, yes. <laughs> so that's probably an um, overreaction and uh, people are building on this bad news. And we know, for example, in finances, in stock markets, people are biased in terms of reacting to bad news. Honestly, think about even us, when there is some good news, we spend only a few hours to be happy on a day. But if it's bad news, we spend the whole week. Like, we think about it. So the markets always react much, in terms of magnitude, much higher to negative news than positive news. And uh, f that, that's, uh, this is normal. But you know, it's, it's funny with Bitcoins. Uh, usually we see the curve of uh, ret stock return to be more tilted to, to the right with some extreme negative. 
uh, uh, returns. Here, if you look at the graph, initial uh, results we have, it's exactly like a bell curve, beautiful bell curve, with extreme good and extreme bad. It's more symmetric. So uh, this, is, this is fascinating because there's a lot of hope there. There's a lot of hope. But, you know, I'm not saying Bitcoin will necessarily survive. Maybe the new currency comes and, you know, and replace new technology. So, uh, but at least what if you look at professionals in finance world, like New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ, uh, these are not average people. They, these are professionals, and they see a lot of potential there. So they have not necessarily be right, but at least there is, it looks like something there. So, uh, great. Thanks. Thank you. Thank Senator Ringette, please. A small but a very important question. Yeah. Um, yes. Should the Bank of Canada develop its own Canadian cryptocurrency? Uh, they already <coughs> thinking of uh, having Canadian dollars in electronically, right? This is what I. But maybe computing, uh, competing, sorry, with the private sector. I don't know if it's a good idea or not. Um, but wouldn't it provide the consumer security aspect that you're you're looking for, and so are we uh, with this study? Yes, you know you know why I'm saying that because maybe because if this is a private sector, if this private thing will fail. It may not be a big impact, but if the government of Canada invests a lot of money or invests a lot of resources and replaces this, and this will not work. Uh, I think it will affect the whole economy. You see, that's what. Th so usually, I think government should be a little bit not risk taker. Uh, but I find I encourage that personally. But I think we give, have to give it more time to see how things are evolving, and then to consider that. So this is my view, because um, I think there's a lot of stake there. That you know, there's a lot of things there uh, at stake. If you think, because this is Bank of Canada, this represents the whole economy. Eh? So um, it, you can maybe do it small scales, I don't know, but uh, full-fledged, I don't encourage that. So this is my view. I'm not really risk taker, so. so. But it would only be the, a, a digital version of the physical Canadian dollar. Yeah, this is, I think they're already considering that, right? So uh, they're already considering that. I don't think it's a bad idea for the Canadian dollars. Mm -hmm. So. But coming up, uh, beside the Canadian dollar, coming up with other currency like bitcoins or electronic thing, this no, is, no. yeah, this is, uh, I thought, sorry, I thought like maybe you're thinking that no, way. No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, for Canadian dollars, I don't think it would be a problem. But uh, sorry, I was thinking if other currency like bitcoins or litcoins, no, yes, no, no. yes, yeah, no. yeah, yeah. Professor Sadi, yes. thank you very much for your appearance before My us today. You've been pleasure. very, very helpful in our deliberations. Thank you. thank you. And I express the great appreciation of the Senate Banking Committee. Thank you all for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks. This meeting is concluded.